Welcome to .NET Conf 2018. Uh, my name is Scott Hunter, and I'm a program manager at Microsoft on the .NET platform. And I've got Mads with me as well, who works on our languages. And I've got uh, Miguel with me as well, who works on Xamarin Mobile. So uh, we are super excited to be here today. We have a lot of really cool material. Um, I'm going to talk about .NET. Uh, then we're going to have Mads come on and talk about C Sharp for a little bit. And then uh, Miguel is going to come in and talk about Xamarin and Mono and some other cool stuff that we're working on. Uh, so to kick it off, um, <clears throat> let's roll into this thing. OK, so uh, .NET. Um, one of the mantras we've had the last couple of years is you can build any type of application in .NET, whether it's a desktop application, a web application, a cloud application, mobile, gaming. Uh, we just recently, earlier this year, added IoT support for .NET Core and AI support for the .NET platform. So we think that uh, no matter what you want to build, you can build it with .NET. Um, really excited about the growth of .NET. Uh, people always ask me, hey, should I invest in .NET? Is it still growing? Um, One million new developers uh, in the last year. And so .NET is a super healthy platform and super growing. Uh, the other one is .NET Core. Um, you know, we shipped this a couple years ago. It's starting to mature in the .NET Core 2.0 uh, wave. Um, and we've got over half a million developers every day writing code in .NET Core. Um, so we're super happy about that. Um, the last time I spoke to everybody was around the build conference, and we were showing some previews of .NET Core 2.1. Uh, we shipped this uh, at the end of May, um, and uh, you can get it today. Um, I wanted to quickly highlight uh, some of the big things that happened in .NET Core 2.1. Um, and you'll see here, uh, We've always cared about performance in .NET, and we want to prove to our customers that .NET is a super fast platform. Uh, so there's a public benchmark, which means we don't, you know, uh, we, we don't run, the, run the benchmark. And we've been working to continue to make .NET work better in all phases of that benchmark. And so you can see here on the slides, plain text, we're up 15%. Um, JSON, we're up 18%. Uh, data access, we're up 147%. Um, and, and the last one probably matters the most because most applications actually are some form of rendering and some form of uh, data access. And you can see these huge Im improvements in all of these. I, uh, I actually have the benchmark uh, running in my browser. And I wanted to highlight a few things in that benchmark real quick. Uh, this is round 16, the latest round of the benchmark. And I'm going to go to plain text. Um, and what's interesting about plain text, if I scroll down here, you can see that we have ASP.NET Core at around number 11 in this. But you're going to notice that the top players here mm -hmm. um, are all roughly at the exact same percentile. We're at 99 percentile compared to 100 percentile. The delta between ASP.NET Core and the top item uh, is roughly less than 150,000 uh, requests per second. So everybody at the top is super fast, um, and we're at the top of that. Now, what I said before is, Great, plain text. Who writes a plain text application? Not, not many people. Um, if I go to Fortunes, this is the craziest form of the demo where, or, or the benchmark. It's got uh, web rendering, it's got data access, it's calling endpoints. Um, and you're going to see ASP.NET um, is once again in roughly the top 10 in this. Uh, and this is where you saw that data growth, the, uh, making our data performance grow. Uh, is what helped us catapult uh, .NET into here. So the thing I want you to know is if you're a .NET developer and you're using ASP.NET Core, um, you're using one of the fastest web frameworks on the planet. Um, and that's something we care about and we'll keep working on. So back to the slides. Um, what were the major features? And I'm just going to quickly go through those. Um, uh, we had a bunch of cool features in .NET Core uh, 2.1. One was global tools. Uh, this is the ability to actually in install command line tools right from NuGet. You can, um, if you're familiar with NPM, you could do npm install g. That would globally install a tool. Uh, now we have a .NET version of that same thing. So you can write a cross-platform .NET Core console application uh, and install it with a one-line command on any device. Um, we re rewrote uh, the socket layer uh, in .NET, uh, which is why you saw some of those performance numbers you saw in those benchmarks. Um, but we didn't just focus on the server, we also focused on the client. We rewrote the HTTP client to be way faster. It's about 10 times faster in .NET Core 2.1. Uh, we continue to make .NET Core 2.1 more compatible uh, with existing .NET. So there's a, a Windows compatibility uh, NuGet package. If you're an EF, EF Core customer, my favorite feature here 
um, is we added lazy loading. It's one of the most popular features in EF uh, that our customers are using. It wasn't in core. Uh, once again, we're feedback driven. We took that feedback, added it to EF core 2.1. Uh, then in ASP.NET Core, um, there's been this huge push this, this, this year in making all websites HTTPS. And so ASP.NET Core is HTTPS by default. Uh, for the first time ever, we've allowed you to take web UI and actually put it into a library, a NuGet package, so you can share it across multiple applications. Um, and we have this really cool feature called HTTP Client Factory, which I'll do a demo in a second. And we also brought one of our uh, beloved frameworks from the .NET Framework world, Signal R is now available in core as well. So let's jump here and uh, I'll talk about one more thing real quick. Um, Signal R, as it, as it RTM for core in 2.1, um, we also know that Signal R, uh, we always have customers call us and say, how do I build a really highly scalable Signal R? We have an Azure service uh, that you can run your Signal R backend in uh, inside of Azure and you can just drag sliders to auto scale that application and we do all the heavy lifting for you. And what I'm super excited to announce today is uh, on September 24th at Ignite, we're going to GA this service. So let's move on and let's do a quick demo of .NET Core 2.1. So I mentioned this thing called HTTP Client Factory and um, we always talk about it and it, it sometime, sometimes I think confuses people because it's, it's kind of a hard to, hard to see feature and I'm going to try to, to dumb it down today and make it really simple for everybody to see. So I've got a, uh, an application here, and it's got an API. And I'm just using the typical values controller that we give you in a default, in, in a default application. So it's not, got, uh, uh, it's not doing anything crazy. Um, I've got a get method that just returns a value. So it's not very usable, uh, but it, it's going to highlight the point. So let's take this API, and let's, let's start it. So I will just go over here, and we'll say start without debugging and the API is going to boot up and run. Now I've got a simple app, and I'm sure this app is, is very simple, similar to what uh, you, the customer, is probably doing, and it's got this index HTML, uh, CSHTML, and inside of it, it makes an API call. Um, let me just take that away. It makes an API call, so it's not, not anything crazy, and you have all probably done this, and this is great. I can run this application, and so basically whenever the index page is hit, it makes an API call to uh, that API. And I'm sure your applications do something like this, whether it's a desktop app, a web app, and you can see this, this works great. Now, um, I'm gonna change things a little bit. Let me go back to, to my, my API, and I wrote this cool uh, piece of code here. Um, it's called a random failure middleware. And so what it's gonna do, it's gonna make my app fail randomly. And I wanna do that because <clears throat> We know networks go up and down, uh, connections go up and down, and you should make apps resilient to this. So I'm just gonna add this middleware, random failure middleware, and if I scroll here, you'll see that all it does is looks to see if a random value is there, and it throws an exception sometimes, and sometimes it doesn't throw an exception. So let's restart this app. Oops. We'll restart the app with that middleware enabled. And now if I go back to my client app, you know, I, I assume everybody's going to expect what's going to happen is if I'm back in my client app, it's going to start failing occasionally. There you go. As I refresh the page, it fails. So what would you do as a customer? In the past, what you would do is you would go into your index page, and you would probably write some retry logic around this. Now, that's great. Um, you'd write this retry logic everywhere you call an API, or maybe you only harden one API or another API. Um, or maybe you write a wrapper around HP Client that does this for you. And so what we've done uh, in 2.1 is we've added the ability for you to set policies. So I can say add, let's go down here, HTTP Client. And I can now, <clears throat> with, with the, what I can do here is I can create a HP client factory. And what this means is I can create a, an HP client and give it a bunch of rules. And with those rules, I can define a bunch of stuff that you can do. So look here, add HP client API, and then I say 
add transit error policy. So I'm saying, hey, I want to have a uh, an, an error policy. And what I do say is I, here is I say policy uh, retry async six, which basically means if you fail, try again six times. Now you can, you can set multiples of these. There's a whole bunch of these that are available. Uh, but by, by setting that, that line there, um, I've now got a, a set of rules that are applied. And then in my, in my code, instead of creating a, an HP client this way, I can go and ask the factory to do that for me. Uh, client equals factory, create client, oops. And I'm going to give it that name that you saw earlier, API, so it will look that up. And then so, Everywhere in my code, instead of just newing up an HTTP client, now I say, factory, give me one called this, and those rules are applied to it. So I can now run this code again. And now, even with that API throwing exceptions, this app is not going to crash because, no, 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 no. It's complaining that the app is still running. There we go. Now we're going to run it again here. And I can refresh this as many times as I want. It'll never crash because I've set that policy. And so this is a great feature. You should be using it in your apps today. Um, set your policies. Don't write code around all these APIs. And it's part of our, our work to make microservices better uh, in .NET. So let's move on. And let's talk about uh, 2.2. So just this morning, we shipped uh, Preview 2 of .NET Core 2.2. It's available today. You can grab it right now. Um, and let's talk about some of the big highlights or the themes that we have in the 2.2 wave. One of these things is we want to make web APIs easier to build. Um, every app, uh, whether it's a web app or a, a mobile app or a desktop app, is probably calling some APIs. We know this is a, an important area, so we want to make it easier for you to build APIs and to build clients that can call those APIs. You just saw with the HTTP client work we did in 2.1, we make it easier to call APIs. Uh, microservices, we hear microservices all the time, and so there's a bunch of work we're doing to make microservice uh, better in .NET. And we're always continuing, to, continuing performance, whether it's building your applications or running your applications, those are the big themes. So let's go over some of the, the major features. Multi-tier JIT compilation. This is the ability for us to quickly JIT your application and get it running, and then to notice if it's, if it's actually hitting the same method a lot of times, Maybe we should JIT it again and make a faster version of it. SQL connection with token auth. This is a support for the first time to actually grab a token to talk to your SQL server from Active Directory. Um, so you don't ever have to have any client uh, uh, credentials that are put in configuration files or anything like that. Uh, EF Core, uh, one of my first two features are my favorite, uh, Cosmos DB. We know that there's uh, non-relational databases out there, and you might want to use the same EF programming model to talk to a relational database or a non-relational database. So you can use Azure Cosmos uh, right from EF Core today with uh, 2.2. Spatial extensions. This has been one of the most requested features for EF, which is spatial in, in this case is um, types for geographic locations. If you want to have a longitude, latitude, because maybe when you want to look at somebody's uh, GPS coordinates and figure out where they are uh, and run queries in a database, uh, we've not had those in, C uh, in, in uh, EF uh, or .NET Core. And so those are, those are both there. Um, we have a feature in EF where you can actually point it at an existing database and it will make you a model. Now it has the ability to actually take views in that database and expose them in the model for you as well. So those are some pretty awesome features in EF Core. ASP.NET Core, we've updated all our templates with the latest versions of, of web frameworks, whether it's Bootstrap or Angular. Web API is one of my favorites. Uh, one of the common things that I get when I go talk to customers is, um, how do I secure an API? And so for the first time ever with 2.2, um, I think it'll be in preview three, we're going to have the ability for you to actually secure your API endpoints in the box. We've got support for HTTP2. That's been a long request. Um, health checks. Uh, uh, Glenn Condron's going to do some demos uh, later in, in .NET Conf around this. This is the ability, if you're building microservices, to, to have checks in your apps uh, or in your microservice for it to actually report whether it's healthy or not, um, especially if you're running in a container infrastructure. That's really important. Uh, we've got a SignalR Java client. So if you want to use SignalR from Java, uh, we've got support for that. So that's some of the major features. 
Let's do a quick demo uh, of .NET Core 2.1. So what I've got here for that is there's a demo I showed at Build um, where we were showing how you actually can do diagnostics um, on uh, APIs. And so let me do that here. So as we think about microservices, things that we think about in the team is we, how do we make APIs better? One of those things we want to do is we want to, we want to integrate Swagger into the API so it actually uh, gives uh, metadata that we can use to provide a richer experience of building clients or debugging. Uh, the other one that I always have fun uh, showing people is this is an API app. And so if I just run it in Visual Studio, um, you get this great experience uh, of 404 because there's no, there's no web in there. And so we really want to fix this uh, debugger experience that we have. So we actually have a global tool uh, that will ship uh, at some point uh, in the 2.2 wave. Um, and I'm going to switch my browser to be that global tool. That's a, you know, as I was saying before, .NET 2.0 uh, oh, brought these global tools. Uh, and now you can actually, we're, we're using them ourselves. So now when I run this application, and let's go look at the app real quick. Um, I've got a controller here um, with a bunch of people in it. Uh, these people are obviously ranked in order, uh, me, Hanselman, and Guthrie. Um, and it just returns, returns people. How would I test this API? Well, now that I've changed my browser to the, the REPL, um, here we are in a command prompt, and I can just do an ls, and that's going to show me the, the controllers I have. You can see people and values. If I want to get the people, I can just say get people. And, and if you look here, that goes and makes that request. You can see it brings you know, Hunter, Hansel, and Guthrie. Um, I can do things like uh, CD into people, and then I can just do a get. Um, so we let you move around uh, like, you, like, you, like you might want to. Uh, great for testing UI uh, or APIs. I can, I can make changes, just come back here, rerun those APIs. Maybe you like UI. I can jump right in here, go into the UI. Maybe I want to add another person here. Just type in uh, .NET Conf. And I can basically say, try it out. That'll send that request. And I should be able to here to say, get people again. And there's .NET Conf. So the goal here is to make it easier to uh, build and debug APIs uh, with .NET Core. So let's close out of that. And let's move on. OK, .NET Core 3 update. Um, at build, I was talking about .NET Core 2. When we first started it, it supported uh, web and cloud applications. Um, at Build, we talked about adding desktop applications, IoT applications, and AI applications. So we vastly are expanding the workloads you can actually build on top of .NET Core. Um, so let's, let's briefly recap what happened to Build. I talked about su adding support for WinForms and WPF uh, to .NET Core. So for the first time ever, you can build desktop applications uh, on .NET Core. Um, we support a bunch of the, the other features that Windows talked about, XAML islands, uh, this allows your apps to host any of the newer controls, uh, the UWP controls, in your WinForm or WPF apps. Uh, we talked about uh, XAML controls. This is taking some of the most common uh, UWP controls and wrapping them up into WinForm and WPF controls. You can just drag in, so if you want a, a modern browser or a mod modern media player, and high DPI fixes. We've talked about adding support for all the Windows 10 uh, APIs into to .NET Core 3. And finally, uh, one of the bigger things we, we talked about that I'm really excited about is uh, being able to do what we call the app bundler. This is build a standalone .NET executable that does not require anything on the machine at all. Uh, simple self-contained exe uh, that can run uh, your applications. So really cool feature. A lot of people ask, why? Why did, why did, you, why did you move these old frameworks onto .NET Core? First off, they're awesome frameworks. Uh, the big thing is you get all the .NET Core benefits side by side. You can run multiple versions of WinForms or WPF on the machine. And uh, it won't, they won't break your applications. If you install a new version of WinForms, it won't break any of the other applications that uh, use, use WinForms. Uh, you can have a machine global or an app lo local version of those frameworks. If you want to copy WinForms into your app, it'll use the one in your app. If you want to use a global one, you can use a global one. Um, you get some of the core runtime and API improvements. This is 
Um, because .NET Core is side by side, we can make API fixes that we couldn't make in .NET Framework, and so you get those. And you get our really cool uh, new, new version of CS Proj that you can edit by hand. So you get a bunch of these features. Now, um, let's talk about what's happened since build. Uh, WinForms is now available in our nightly builds. I don't recommend running our nightly builds, um, but if you go to github.com.net core-sdk, you can download uh, the latest SDK from there. And once you do, you can actually just type .NET new WinForms. Uh, Visual Studio, the, new, the, new, the latest versions of Visual Studio now support building and debugging these WinForm desktop applications um, directly in the IDE. We don't have support for the designers yet. Uh, that'll be coming soon. Um, but this is the next step. And then finally, um, we plan to publish a preview, a public preview, later this year um, in non-nightly builds so you can start trying to move your applications to .NET Core for the desktop. And so let's do a quick demo of that. Uh, so what I'm going to do is just go to a command prompt here, and let's make dir winforms, cd winforms. And I'm going to do something new, .NET new winforms. Let's just drill in here and show that. Um, just like you can do .NET new web, .NET new console, well, now I can do .NET new winforms. And after I do that, I can run .NET run. There you go. And so I, I built a WinForm application in just a few seconds, uh, typed a few commands, and boom, I'm in here and, and it's running. So what else can I do here? So let's load VS up. And what I'll do is I will come over here and I will open a new project. And let's go into that folder and open that CS proj. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I might have to launch a new version of ES, but let's try it real quick. Boom. Okay, so you saw I could run it right in VS, but I want to I want to show this is this is a core project. So if I go and edit my CS proj, there's the .NET SDK, WinExe is the output type, .NET Core 3.0. It's re it's it's referencing the uh, desktop UI. Uh, let's see what you can actually do here. I'm going to go into the form editor, editor here, and I can come in here and say things like label one dot text equals dot net conf rocks. There you go. And to prove that uh, the debugger works, I can come over here, put a breakpoint in here. So I've got a WinForms .NET Core project. My debugger works. I get full IntelliSense in the project. Um, so we're making a lot of progress uh, in this. And if, as I said, if you want, uh, it is available in the nightly builds. Uh, you can just run, run over here and install the uh, 3.0 installer from the, the GitHub page and try this yourself um, if you want. Um, but full WinForm support. While we're sitting here talking about WinForms, I want to I want to show one more thing about WinForms. Um, at build, I showed that we had, you know, one of the reasons you might want to run your WinForm application in .NET Core. So let's look at that real quick. This is the sample that I ran at uh, the build conference. Uh, at this point, when we built this. Uh, you kind of had to hand build projects. You didn't have that support I just showed before. You could .NET new and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but I just want to want to reshow this to highlight um, one of the things that was really cool about that demo. And this is uh, a simple app uh, that we ran. Um, let's do this. And all it does is it takes a folder and it goes and iterates over that folder. And and uh, you can see it's showing me how much stuff's in those folders. And you can see this completed in seven, 755 milliseconds. I also have a version of that that runs on core. And I can take that same folder and run that again, 282 milliseconds. So I'll bring these together so you can see and there's 
The, the big thing here is the core version of this, you can see ran about three times faster, two to three times faster than the, uh, the .NET Framework version of this. And this is, is because, of, as I said before, we've had, we've had time to go through and take uh, some of the APIs and improve them. Um, and with .NET Core, because it's completely side by side, uh, com we, can, we can not worry about compatibility the same way we have to do with .NET Framework. With .NET Framework, we're afraid to touch those APIs because it's installed on billions of machines and we can't break anybody's applications. With .NET Core, the customer makes the choice, the developer makes the choice, which version of .NET Core they want to use. Um, and Windows updates and, and updates to the machine won't break those applications. Uh, but you can see, uh, we made a bunch of progress since build. I can now build these things from the command line. Um, I can open, edit, debug inside of Visual Studio. Um, and you see that I get a, a, a big performance boost um, in these applications because they're running on core. Um, as I said before, we hope to have a public preview uh, later this year uh, where you can try these bits without running a nightly. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll get designer support in that time frame as well. I don't know, but we're, we're working on it. And that's an update on uh, .NET Core 3. So let's talk about uh, Blazor. Uh, Blazor is a cool project that we uh, started showing, uh, it seems like about a year ago. And um, it, it, the, the version we showed uh, a year ago was, we, we called it an experimental project. And what it does is it allows you to build client-side web UI in .NET. Um, so you know, we have lots of customers that might feel more familiar with C-sharp than they are with JavaScript. Uh, they might not want to, to learn the uh, JavaScript framework of the, of the, of the year, um, Angular React View, um, and they want to take advantage of the stability and consistency of .NET. So that's what Blazor was, was built about. Uh, Blazor used a technology called WebAssembly uh, to uh, basically load .NET into the, the browser. So we can actually run a version of .NET live in the browser, and so you have uh, .NET running both in the browser on the client uh, and on the server. And there's some cool benefits. You, because you're running .NET, uh, you get, you're going to get native performance, you can share types between your client and server, and it requires nothing on the browser. There's no extension or plugin or whatever. It just works. Uh, and so we've been showing this for, I said, a couple months now. Um, I have a slight update on this. Um, what we've done is, as you show Blazor, uh, and I'm going to do a demo in a second, the most popular part about Blazor is the programming model is just amazing. Um, I can be in uh, some HTML, and I can just call C Sharp. I can use the skills that I already have. Um, so we, we've, we've decided that we're going to take that programming model and we're going to move it into ASP.NET Core 3. Um, but it's a little different than, than the experimental version uh, in that the experimental, experimental version, we're running .NET Core in the browser. Um, the, the version that we're going to first start with that will be in uh, ASP.NET Core 3 is going to run uh, that same code on the server. Uh, the programming model is exactly the same, so you don't have to change any code. I'll actually build a Blazor app in a second, and it doesn't matter whether it runs on the client or the server, uh, you get this awesome programming model. Um, and so the cool thing is, um, as we do this, you're going to be able to take advantage of this. And then in the future, um, when we have a version of .NET that we're really happy with uh, running in WebAssembly, you'll be able to just uh, change a few lines of code, um, and your app will then start running with .NET in the client, and you'll get even more performance. So uh, super happy to announce this. And let's do a, a quick demo of this, because um, this is cool tech. So what I've got here is I'm going to close these out. And I'm going to open up my Blazor app here. And I was sitting around, um, we were talking about what, what, what's a great way to show uh, this tech. And so I wanted to take a common application programming thing that somebody might do today um, with some JavaScript and show you how you would rewrite that in C Sharp uh, and get the same benefits. So this is a, a web page. And you can see here in my web page, I have an image of a bot. I've got a button here. And on, the, on, on click, it calls change image. And let's go look at change image. Change image is JavaScript. Uh, it's right here. It goes and grabs that bot element, so it goes and finds the, the, the bot here, the image tag, and it then goes and grabs the source attribute for that, and it says, hey, if that's got a 1 in it, replace it with a 2. If it's got a 2 in it, replace it with a 1. 
Um, and so let's run this and see what this does. Oops, still have my API client there running. So let's turn this off back to my browser. There we go. Run this again. And so this is going to come up. And uh, um, if I click on this, my bot's going to, going, to, going to switch and do that all client side. Super, super cool. What would that look like if you wanted to rewrite that in C Sharp? Let's try that. So what we'll do is we'll go back to that uh, index. And first thing I want to do is I need to write some C Sharp in this web page. So I'll create a functions block. And inside of this block, I can write whatever C Sharp that I want to write. So uh, first off, we need, a, we, need a, we need a URL. So let's do string uh, image URL equals. And let's just grab this image we already have here. That's great. We'll stick that in there. And now I need a method uh, that will change this image. I need to do that same swap we were doing in JavaScript. So I'll do void change image. And let's, let's just write it pretty, pretty much the same way as, as, as you saw it in the JavaScript. If image URL contains a one, then what I would do is I would set image URL equals image URL dot replace. And I'll replace the one with a two. And else, image URL equals image URL dot replace. And we'll just replace the two with a one. So I'm basically, every time uh, the URL, we, we call this method, we look to see what URL we have. If it's got a one in it, we change it to a two. If it's got a two in it, we change it to a one. And we do that because in my app, I've got two images over here, a .NET bot one and a two. So here's just you know, regular C Sharp. Now what I would do is come up here and, and where I have this, uh, this, this here, I'd erase this. And we'll just say at image URL. Typical Razor C Sharp syntax. Um, and where it gets kind of cool here is on this on click where I'm calling this JavaScript function, I will now add an at sign here to call the C Sharp function. Remove those two. And now I've actually rewritten the same app uh, that would normally use JavaScript to change the two images to now use Blazor to change those two images. So let's run this again. And it's complaining a little bit. Let me just cancel the build, rebuild again. There we go. I screwed up somewhere, didn't I? Yes. Left a semicolon off. So let's put the semicolon in here. Once again, same experience you would expect in Visual Studio. You can see it doing its stuff. And now that same app that I just showed before using a JavaScript function now does the exact same thing, all written in C Sharp. So, I think this programming model is amazing. Um, if you're a web developer building Razor-based uh, ASP.NET Core applications today, you're going to love this. Um, if you want to write your JavaScript in C Sharp, or JavaScript kinds of stuff in C Sharp, you now can do that. And as I said, it'll be a core feature of ASP.NET Core 3, um, and the ability to run that on the client using WebAssembly will be something that we continue to work on as we move forward as well. So let's jump back over here. And uh, we'll move on. <clears throat> so uh, the next thing we want to talk about is machine learning and .NET. Um, the last couple of years, you read the news, you hear about machine learning and AI. They're hot topics. Um, and at Build, uh, we talked about uh, wanting to, to, to build your own custom models. Um, uh, a great example of this, one of the demos we showed at Build, is our GitHub repo has tons of issues filed in it. And we looked to see if we could go build a bot that would actually go and, and take those, in, those, those uh, issues and automatically classify them uh, to the right areas. 
Um, and in our case, we had plenty of data. So we took all the data that our team has done by manually moving those things over the years, ran it through something. So we took that data uh, and we then pushed it into ML.net to build a model and then we ran that model. Um, and so I want to announce today we have ML.net uh, 0.5. Uh, you can get it right here. It's the latest preview of those ML.net bits that we uh, shipped to build. Continuing to improve this, make it better, make it easier for you to use. Um, please go out and try this today. Um, you can see that, uh, that we've shipped four previews. There's a whole bunch of areas that uh, F-sharp support you can see here. We've got a bunch of samples, including that sample that GitHub Classifier uh, is now up there, and we're continuing to uh, embrace this technology. A uh, big thing about ML.NET that I like to tell customers as well is this tech is built on tried and true AI that we use inside of Microsoft. So if you're using Office or Bing, you're likely using some of the same tech that ML.NET is based on. Um, and so tomorrow, uh, we're going to kick off with uh, a session on machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence, I think, with uh, uh, Ankit and Caesar. So you should be excited about that. And next, I want to bring in uh, Mads uh, to come talk about the new enhancements we have coming in C-sharp. Let's go on, sir. Thank you, Scott. It's going great. Let me just get the PowerPoint up here. So if you don't know Mads, uh, Mads works on all the managed languages at Microsoft, uh, whether it be C-sharp, VB, or F-sharp. Um, and today, uh, he's here to basically show us some of the enhancements that we have coming in new C-sharp. So. All right. So um, first, uh, let's talk a little bit about what we already did. So we, we went through no less than a slew of different um, versions of C-sharp over the last year or so. We have uh, what we call point releases. C Sharp 7.1, 7.2, and 7.3. Um, looks like the slideshow uh, went away there. Let's try again. Now I gave away my little unicorn there. So uh, essentially, this idea with the uh, with the um, point releases was to uh, get better at giving you value um, right away rather than bulk everything up for releases that are uh, further between. But we also had some concrete value uh, around uh, span of T and um, efficiency at the low level that we wanted to get in quicker. And so there are three sort of loose themes in these uh, point releases. There's the uh, safe, efficient code, um, which underlies some of the improvements we got on Tech Empower, for instance. And uh, then there's just general more freedom, allowing you to do more things uh, that were forbidden before. Uh, various uh, ways of abbreviating things, the usual like little uh, juicy features. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about the safe, efficient code in a minute. But uh, of course, we also want to talk about C-Sharp 8. The main theme here is it's going to be magical. Uh, I will, um, if the demo gods prevail, I will um, show a little of uh, that as well um, in, in, this, um, in this keynote. So, uh, but let's start out with the um, with the .NET, uh, with the C Sharp 7.1, 7.2, and 7.3, and this theme about safe and efficient. So, if you're writing sort of low-level code or you're trying to uh, get performance, you essentially have to nav uh, navigate between the Scylla and Charybdis. Uh, that is, um, garbage collection uh, can be, you know. Uh, provide an overhead and unpredictability of your performance at the low level. But if you try to avoid garbage collection and you start using structs and things that aren't allocated, then you run the risk of copying too much. And so essentially, um, we ratcheted up our toolbox for dealing with, for navigating these uh, waters. And so um, uh, Odysseus here uh, is going to use span of T to navigate between the, between the two um, dangers that lurk on either side of the strait here. Um, and there are several language features that are there to enhance the span of T experience and help out with, these, with uh, how you can write uh, struct-based and array-based code without getting too much copying. So let's go and have a look at span of T. Um, we are having a lot of flicker here. Um, there we go. So. Um, Span is essentially this idea that while .NET has arrays and they're sort of an efficiently packed chunk of memory, um, there's no easy way to uh, refer to 
uh, other chunks of memory, so to speak. There's no window onto contiguous memory um, uh, the way that you might want. Uh, so here I have a simple program that um, uh, creates an array, initializes it, and writes it out. And to show what uh, span is about, let's just quickly look at array, and uh, we see that there are some new uh, extension methods here related to the, um, to the span features in um, .NET Framework. So um, uh, there's as span, for instance, here, so I can take the array and somehow get it as a span. So it should not click out a percent of you. Sorry, guys. Um, not in percent of you. Okay. I don't know why it's showing that thing. So tell me where to back up from. This always happens. I thought something else was going to go wrong today, and it's still me. Um, but uh, for now, back in, I'm back in Visual Studio. You guys are probably just looking at, you're looking at mobile development with Miguel, Miguel de Casa or something like that. Um, so uh, give me a thumbs up when the, when the code is up. In the meantime, um, I can talk a little bit about span of t without visuals. Um, so the idea is that you can essentially, a span is essentially a view onto uh, an array or a contiguous um, expanse of memory. And so when you have a span, it's just like an array, but it lets you view the, the bits of maybe some other array or um, of, um, well, here we go again of um, other memory that may be allocated in other ways. Okay, so there we are. So uh, I don't know how much you caught here, but I haven't, uh, let's just start from scratch with the demo. I have an array, I'm initializing it, I'm writing out the elements. Now I want to do some fun with spans. So uh, let's take the array and look at the new extension methods that are on there. I can say as span. What I get back is a new type that is called span of t. In this case, I have a span of int. Uh, so let's write that out just so it's clear, though I'm normally a, a var lover. Uh, so now I have a span here. Um, what you can do with the span now over the array is, um, well, obviously, if I initialize the array, let's have a look at what uh, the elements in the span are. Um, let's try to run the program. See what the demigods say to that. Oh, there we go. So you can see that even though I even though I created the, array, the span from the array before I initialized the array, the modifications to the array down here are visible through the span. So it's really like a window onto the same memory. Um, and um, why is it interesting to see the same memory? Well, maybe I don't want to see all of it. Maybe I want to just, uh, for instance, take a slice of it. And rather than copying all the elements that are in a given slice, let's say from element three and five elements, um, Maybe instead of doing that, um, I want to uh, just get a window onto it and not actually uh, modify or create a new array, which is an expensive thing. So here we have a slice. Um, and if we write out the elements of the slice, it should show just the, um, just the elements uh, that we're looking at. But the slice is still, an, um, it's still a view onto the original array. If I go into the... Um, into the slice and say assign to the second element. Let's assign 100 in there. And we write out uh, the elements of the original span, say. Um, then you can see that the uh, fifth, or whatever it is, the sixth element of the span uh, has been modified as well. Because we're, again, we're still uh, modifying the same memory. So that's a very useful feature. Um, there, are, um, there may be concerns about this whole, oh, I can modify memory through other objects. If you don't like people modifying it, but you just want them watching along, you can use a read-only span, which is just a version of the type that does not allow assignment. So you can see my modification through the slice here is now disallowed. So I can pass these out to others. They can observe my changes, but they can't affect changes of their own. 
So that's it for span. Uh, let's return to the slide deck and hope that it projects. Uh, we're here and projecting. So, um, and talk about black holes, or rather, um, you know, the uh, scourge that has been writing uh, object oriented programming for many years, which is um, null reference exceptions. You can probably come up with others, but I think this is the big one. And we decided in C Sharp 8, as part of the magic unicorn thing, to uh, help you avoid null reference exceptions. So uh, this is where um, uh, to, um, let's actually, let's skip the slides and see if the demo works. Um, this is where uh, things uh, currently, they came together last minute here. So we'll have a, we'll have a look and see if this, um, if this works out. So um, first of all, I have a program here. I have a good friend, Miguel de Casa, um, who has no middle name, he assures me. And now I'm trying to get the length of his middle name by uh, calling the get length of middle name here and simply returning the length of his middle name. Um, well, this is, looks like innocuous code, but is going to uh, throw a null reference exception. Um, it, because I'm, um, I'm getting his middle name, he doesn't have a middle name, so it's probably going to be null. When I access the length off of it, that's going to give us a null reference exception. Well, who's really to blame here? Um, let's go look at the person class that, um, that we created here. We can see that we have um, first name, a middle name, and a last name. But in the constructor that I use for Miguel, I'm only initializing the first and the last name. If only I had a feature that could tell me, whoa, um, they either tell me, whoa, you're not initializing uh, the middle name, it could be null, or uh, a feature that I could tell, well, I want it to be null. Well, that's what the nullable feature is about. And the way I turn it on is to um, use an attribute called non-null types. And uh, when I put that on the module, you can see that I get a warning on the, um, on the person class here, a warning saying you did not, um, let's, sorry, let's uh, see if we can hover over the warning here. It's saying you did not initialize uh, a non-null um, a non-null uh, field. So I can either, you know, go initialize it, middle name equals null. I want it to be null. Uh, and then that warning goes away, but I get another warning saying, you're putting null into middle name. So what's going on here? Why can't I put null into a reference type? Well, I can't because um, with the new feature turned on, reference types are no longer able to be null without warning. You give, get a warning whenever you put null in there. If you want to have null, you have to explicitly ask for it. So I can go here and explicitly ask for middle name to be nullable. I put a question mark on a string, just like you can today on an int or whatever I'm saying. I want a nullable string here. It might be null. You see the warning goes away. Everything's hunky-dory with my person class. But now when I go back to my program, and I have rightly specified that middle names might be null, then I get a warning here saying, hey, you may be dereferencing a null. And so now the feature is helping me push around where can there be nulls, where can't there be a nulls, and making me uh, correct my code. So what, what are ways I could correct this? Well, maybe, you know, I, um, maybe I have an if statement. Just think about how you would, uh, how you would solve this bug if you, if you got it from, like, say, um, a, a bug report from a customer where you had the null reference exception um, in production. So we can say if p.middle name uh, is null, this is how you should always check for nulls now that you have pattern matching, uh, because it does not, uh, unlike using double equals, it does not use um, uh, overloaded equals operators. It always check, just checks for null. If the middle name is null, well, then that's return zero, for instance. Now look at what happens with the warning. Uh, the warning down here goes away because the compiler does a flow analysis and it knows that by the time it gets to this line of code, uh, p dot middle name is no longer null. So it, it, it's kind of like definite assignment that it tracks the possible values of uh, variables throughout the body of the method and um, make sure that you um, that when you dereference things, um, null is not one of the possible uh, features there. 
uh, possible values there. So that's uh, a quick glimpse at, uh, at nullable reference types. And um, with that, um, I want to uh, bring it back to um, my friend, um, Miguel de Casa, um, who is um, waiting in the wings to tell us a little bit more about Samarang. Thank you very much. Miguel? Thank you, Mats. Well, this is one of my favorite features in C-sharp. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a gift of the gods. In this case, uh, really, a gift of Mads. Uh, <laughs> so anyways, well, Mads and the team, of course. Uh, so, um, I, yeah, uh, so I'm going to talk today about uh, mobile development and uh, what we're doing uh, there for you. Uh, we're uh, here to give you. So here's a little bit of an agenda. I want to talk a little bit about our community, what we're doing uh, to improve our community and our open source contributions. We'll talk about the Android platform, the Apple platforms, Xamarin forms, and a couple of interesting things that are happening uh, coming up. So the... Uh, <clears throat> So first off, we really, I really want to thank everybody uh, that, has been, uh, that has been engaging with us in our open source effort. As you can see, it has been an incredible year for open source contributions to the project. Uh, we only open source these three uh, pieces, the Android support, iOS, and Form support, uh, when Microsoft acquired Xamarin two years ago. So, so these numbers actually reflect the old time is just the last two years when we open sourced. But uh, as you can see, it's, uh, you know, there's a tremendous amount of energy and, and people contributing to the effort. And in Mono's case, you have to keep in mind that this only counts changes to Mono. Um, but we are now pulling about 35% uh, about of the code now. It uh, comes directly from CoreFX and Core CLR, so, so it's even a larger effort. Now, up until this point, you have to realize that when you work with these systems, uh, uh, you know, we came from, a, you know, we came from, a, uh, from the Unix universe, and uh, we were very comfortable <laughs> using Emacs and VI. Uh, make files and every uh, you know thing that we do in the Unix world, but it wasn't particularly easy for newcomers to come in. It's it's an organic system, something that we've grown over the years, and and it's easy if you were part of the community, but if you're a newcomer, it was difficult. Um, so over the years, we've tried different things. Uh, in fact, uh, this effort, an, an effort to improve the way and the easiness of building Mono, started many years ago. My friend uh, Jonathan Chambers, who now works at Unity. I found the first commit. Uh, in 2007, he contributed this change uh, that allowed Mono to be built with Visual Studio, as opposed to this Linux tool chain that, that was ported to Windows that had an emulation layer for Windows and so on. So um, this effort started in 2007, and it actually took us 11 years to get every piece in place. Uh, but the outcome is fantastic. So, these days, this is how you can build Mono on Windows. You just get Visual Studio installed. Uh, the first three lines there are just getting your Git checkout. So uh, download your Mono and, and get all the modules in place. And then uh, the next two lines, the first one runs, builds a Mono runtime for Windows. It's a, it generates a, uh, a native, uh, a native uh, uh, x86-64 uh, binary. And then the second line builds all of the class libraries, so everything that you need, MS Corelib, system, system XML, and so on. Uh, you see a little flag there called Net4x, and that means that in this particular scenario, you are requesting to build the .NET 4.x compatible set of APIs. There's a lot more. Uh, there's the Android APIs, the Monotouch APIs, and so on. But what is really interesting about this is that every assembly now that is part of Mono can be built uh, it comes with a CS proj, which means that you can open it on Visual Studio, you can build it. We do the dependency tracking. So, uh, <clears throat> so what is really nice about that is that uh, is that you don't need to worry about uh, about the chain of compilation, right? We will get all the dependencies uh, for you. And these are just some of the other targets that you can use. Uh, and you know, we support everything under the earth. Now. We really hope that this is going to make it a lot easier for people to come in and contribute fixes and improvements and tuning to, the, uh, to all the mobile SDKs. So just a refresher of what we're doing, right? Uh, we're big into the native, uh, into delivering a native experience for users. So that means native user interfaces. So when you create a button, we want to get a native button so that it behaves the way that user expects, it has the proper animations, proper colors, proper behaviors, touches, and so on. 
integrated with accessibility and so on and every other feature in the US. We want to give you the, all the APIs uh, that the platform offers. So on Android, uh, everything that Google offers. On, on the Apple platforms, everything that Apple offers. So from .NET, you can use everything in there. And of course, we want to give you the best performance possible. And the last thing that we do is we try very hard. We, we, we work very hard. We don't try. We, we work very hard to deliver to you same day support for these platforms. Uh, this past summer, uh, we just shipped our Android support for Android Pie. So, uh, so we have a blog post. We have samples. We have everything to get you started with Android Pie. And, uh, and you, know, you can always count on that. In fact, today is a special day. And we'll get to that in a second. Now, uh, at Build this year, I announced the support for accelerated uh, Android emulation on Windows that work with Hyper-V, right? So some of you had to choose between Hexam and Hyper-V, and this year we work with Google uh, and we got the support for Hyper-V integrated into the Google emulator. I closed my, I closed my session with this uh, beautiful artwork that said, you know, if you get the Windows April update, you're going to be super happy. Uh, today is just the regular Windows update that you can use, and you should be happy. And I say you should because, because Spectre happened. And, uh, and some of the mitigations that were rolled out for Spectre uh, slow, down, slow down the Android emulation. Um, now, the good news is that if you're trying some of the alpha, uh, you know, the previews uh, of Windows, this is addressed. Uh, and, uh, and we're going to have this, uh, you know, for those of you affected by the Spectre, uh, things we're going to address that later uh, uh, this year. Now, uh, so now we wanted to not only improve the uh, Android uh, experience, right, the, the 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 emulator experience, but we wanted to improve your life when you're building applications. And uh, and we've essentially looked at the problem from two perspectives. First, how can we improve the the build times for you when you're building a new project, then you have to rebuild everything from scratch. You do a git checkout, then you got to build the whole thing. Uh, so we spent a lot of time optimizing every step in the pipeline. And we're looking at every step in the pipeline of how we can fix this. Some of these are fixes. Some of those are optimizations. Some of those are profiling. Some of those are being smarter about the things that we do. Uh, and some of those are upgrading some of the tooling capabilities. Some of them are skipping steps. Uh, some of them are avoiding slow processes. Uh, so we're doing a lot of work in that area, and uh, we also want to improve your day-to-day your -day developer experience. So every time that you make a change and you want to test it, uh, we want you to get, to get your code up on the screen as, as, as quickly as possible. Um, now, just so you get a, a feeling for how this works, this is not even a complete picture, but it gives you an idea. Uh, when you build an Android application, you, you, you need to package at the end uh, a zip file that contains everything here that is blue, right? All the blue balls there. Uh, those need to be shipped into the, uh, into the APK. Now, when you, and your sources, right? Um, essentially, the user C-sharp code or, the, uh, or your XAML sources, they need to be compiled um, into your C-sharp. Uh, executable, then we need to inspect it, we need to extract some Java, Java data, then we need to compile that data, then we need to compile it to the native uh, Android format and so on. So this is a series of steps that some of them are serialized and cannot be parallelized and, and they can take a long time. So, uh, so we've been tuning this pipeline, right? So if you make a change here, we got to run everything. If you have native libraries, Java native libraries, well, we got to extract those things. If you have uh, if you have native C libraries, well, we also got to extract those things and we got to get them out. So, uh, oh, what is that thing doing at the bottom of the screen? Hmm. All right. So we need to get the, all of those pieces in place and uh, we've been tuning this. So let me share with you some of the improvements that we're doing right now. So um, this is, we're comparing the, the current stable release against the current master release of a fairly large application. This is called the Smart Hotel 360 app. Uh, Smart Hotel 360 is a sample app that we showed at Connect last year. And uh, it's a relatively large application, 25,000 lines of C Sharp. That's really not the large part, is, uh, is for the sake of expedience and getting this quickly and having a lot of capabilities. This application actually consumes 99 NuGet packages. And this has everything under the sun, uh, .NET standard libraries, support libraries from Google, Google Play services, Azure services, Skia for, for rendering images, native code, uh, everything really, and 32 XAML screens. And we cut down the build times from 2 minutes and 15 seconds to 57 seconds. 
So I'm very excited about what we're doing in terms of, of improving the build times. And all of this happens at the SDK level. So there's really no changes necessary on, the, on Visual Studio. It's all happening at the MS Build level. Uh, so we're all, this, uh, uh, all of these improvements will continue to trickle out. Now, the other thing that we realized is that when you're building forms applications, and in particular, if you're using .NET standard uh, for your shared business logic, Oh, okay. Uh, if you're using a .NET standard for your shared business logic, um, you don't need to run this process the whole time, right? You don't need to run the whole thing and repackage everything. So we've added a mode called fast development mode. And now we have a prototype, a proof of concept. And, uh, and this proof of concept that today exists in a separate form, uh, we're going to we're going to integrate all of that work directly into our build system. And let me share with you uh, what it is. Uh, the proof of content is Xamarin Android Lite. And uh, it gives you the ability of rebuilding your forms application and deploy and run, right? So you make a change at 5, and it's showing on device 3 seconds. It's 2.5, you know, 2.9 seconds, but I want it to be, uh, you know, I wanted to run it up. So it's about 3 seconds to, for, from a change to visualizing it directly on your device. So. Uh, I, we're, I'm looking forward to delivering all of this to you folks uh, later this year. Now, as you know, today is an exciting day. Uh, iOS 12 is very likely going to be announced. Uh, we suspect that it will be coming soon. So good news, we have your iOS 12 support ready, uh, ready in store. And when I say iOS 12, uh, you know, I really mean the entire set of Apple updates that are coming today, which we suspect is iOS, tvOS, macOS, and watchOS. So that's why we internally call it Xcode 10, because it's the whole platform. Uh, but most people think of this as iOS 12. So uh, we're ready for you. You should, uh, you should go and download our, our packages today and uh, start spicing up your apps if you haven't started yet. There's a couple of really interesting things. So uh, probably the one that uh, my favorite feature, in my opinion, is, uh, is support for shortcuts. Um, this is a way that your application can participate in uh, in scripting in the system. So what is interesting is that now your apps can essentially describe an action of something that the user did. And you can, you, uh, the, the, uh, and this action, uh, you need to provide it to the operating system. It's called, you, you donate the action, the intent. Um, and when you donate this thing, this becomes uh, searchable in Siri. It becomes something that you can evoke from Siri. But also, and this is the software programmer in me, uh, you can actually script your application so they can become part of this, uh, of this new shortcut uh, application shipping in iOS 12 where you can script your app and call into your app. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about how you can do this because you essentially need to, uh, you give it a URL, uh, sort of like deep linking, and then the operating system will call into your app and we have something for you there. Then. Um, on uh, uh, also Air Kit 2 is coming out. Uh, we have some good samples for you. And, and what is very nice about Aria Kit 2 is that now it can detect physical objects and remember those, uh, those objects. It can remember spaces, and you can have uh, shared virtual spaces. Uh, that is also very interesting. Uh, we have great samples for you to try out. Our IDE has been updated to support uh, uh, these new capabilities. Air Kit also supports detection of existing objects. So if you have a collection of objects uh, that, uh, that you want to scan or pictures of those, you can build those in. And you've probably seen those demos uh, in the past uh, six months of people building recognizers for uh, little cards or, uh, or bills. Uh, so all of this is built with this technology. Uh, there's a new networking stack. This is an amazing networking stack that was introduced. Uh, if you're trying to do networking today, it's incredibly painful uh, uh, because you have to know too much about how the mobile uh, world works. Uh, disconnections, uh, changing networks, changing paths, and so on. This is a callback-based system. Here's a little bit uh, taste of what it looks like, but it's very interesting because not only does it handle connections, it also handles TLS security for you. It handles bonjour and uh, and you also get state transitions, right? So if you're con if you're uh, phone drops, if there's a connection change, if uh, you connect a new network, you'll handle it there. There's a lot more to try in iOS 12 today, so uh, you should check it out. Now, let me talk about perhaps one of the most exciting things that we've been working in the past for you. It's called the Forms Shell. And uh, 
Xamarin Forms is a write once, run anywhere uh, framework, and we give you a lot of tools. Uh, we give you every uh, control that you can imagine, layout function, and uh, the problem sometimes is that as a new developer trying to create an app, it, it feels like opening a, a bag of Lego and with no instructions, right? And now you get to build a universe. So it is not unusual uh, for, you know, you have a goal, you have an objective, you want to build an app for your particular problem, and before you can get there, you need to figure out navigation, top menus, uh, nesting, uh, how to handle the back button, how to do searches, uh, deep linking. There's all these things. And, and all we've given you, we gave you the pieces. We give you all the pieces, but we didn't really give you any guidance uh, or, uh, or how to stitch these things up. And, and even if you do, sometimes people make mistakes. It becomes bug reports and things that you need to fix and so on. Or you create, uh, so you end up creating user interfaces that look like this, right? Beautiful UIs with italics where they really don't belong. There's these ideas for, for UIs that make no sense. Imagine this is how I envision my first email program. It obviously makes no sense. I don't know whether there's a slider there. I don't know whether there's an arrow. Maybe, the, maybe it's something that you felt, you know, look good on the screen or you saw it somewhere or an emoji and then this other control to, the, that you misuse the control, right? Instead of having buttons, you use this thing, and it's like well, inbox and trash, it's a selector, it's not a button, there's no action. And then at some point in a dream, you had this dream where you thought, you know what it would be cool if you could con control the number of lines in the preview and you make it 12, M nothing makes any sense. Your users look at this and, and, and actually you just move on. You go back to something uh, a lot simpler, like uh, you know, uh, being a physics uh, uh, nuclear researcher. So. We wanted to address this, and what we did is we built this thing called the shell. And the shell, it's an opinionated type that sets up, a, gives you a skeleton, a foundation where you plug in the pieces of your application. You fill in the content that we take care of, the layout and of everything else. We give you a consistent look and feel. You can style it. Uh, you can style it either, uh, you know, uh, the hard way with XAML, or you can style it with CSS, and uh, we take care of the rest. But we also take care of deep linking. So every page in the shell has a URL assigned to it. Uh, and we can launch the application directly into one of these pages. So by building all of this functionality in there, we're taking a lot of the pain away from you and, uh, and we're handling it there, the, uh, ourselves. We also handle material if you want to get a material look and feel on Android, which usually involves a lot of moving pieces and things that you have to do. So I'm just going to give you a quick taste of shell. This is what it looks like. This is a, 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 uh, this is a very simple application where we're, we're trying to emulate with Shell the Google Play Store. So you can see here that uh, uh, the different elements of this app. And if you look at the source code, it's actually trivial. It's very, very simple. All of these UIs are very simple to build. And I'll give you a, a little bit of a taste of that in a second. Um, this is what it looks like on Android and the same app. And here you'll notice that we decided to use a green tint and the tint is, uh, is, uh, is shared across all of the pages, right? To give it a, a look, uh, a consistent look to your app. Uh, we have the same thing for iOS. <laughs> this is, you know, oddly it's uh, the Android Play Store running on iOS, uh, but uh, you get the idea. And this is what it looks like on XAML, right? This is what it looks like on XAML. As you can see, uh, you have a new top level container shell and then you have to uh, fill in some of the details. You can see some pieces there like the flyout header. That's what would come up if you press that hamburger button. Um, then, uh, there, then you have your content for the top, uh, for the bottom menu bar and the items uh, that go inside. Um, the most basic app that you can build is this one, right? This is the simplest version of something that you can have. It has just one homepage. Uh, and, and in this particular example, local column homepage is actually a type in your app and this is what's being rendered inside. Um, if you want to add tabs, all you have to do is add two sections. Right, very simple, the icon, uh, the sections, and, uh, and what you wanted them to be called. Uh, if you wanted to add these nested uh, uh, tabs, uh, you can add them very easily just by adding the shell content there. And finally, uh, um, you know, these are all the idioms that are already baked into the system, right, uh, that, that you can build with, uh, with shell today. Now, uh, the other thing that we're adding to forms are two things that have been highly requested. The first one is the collection view. So we know that you wanted to have a collection view that goes beyond just lists, but we took this opportunity uh, with collection view to, uh, to actually make something of general purpose. 
So this can actually replace the usage of list view, and it has some much better performance characteristics than the old uh, list view. And that is because we no longer use cells. Cells were a great concept, uh, were a great concept, uh, but they, it didn't really map well to the way that it worked. Uh, it was very expensive. So now you just use regular views and data templates. So some of, the, uh, of you that had concerns about the performance of list view uh, were addressing those problems uh, with collection view by essentially eliminating the concepts of cells and going with views and data templates. Uh, let me give you a little bit of a taste of collection view uh, on this video that I have here. I hope I can, I can get it to play. Yep, there it goes. So this is a new UI that uh, previously was not possible to build with the, the, the built-in capabilities, or it would have been very difficult to get this sort of UI. Uh, you can have custom layouts, which I'm sure a lot of you would be very excited to, to use. And the other element is, the other thing is, many of you want to have a carousel view. And it turns out that a carousel view is just a collection view with some good defaults in place. So, uh, so this is a sample just of the carousel view, uh, uh, which again is just a collection view, but it has been customized to have uh, this particular behavior. I want to close with two uh, last pieces. I didn't want to get into every single feature uh, of Forms. There's just too many. Uh, this year, at the beginning, we launched uh, the project F100 which was uh, 100 paper cuts and 100 small features that, uh, that our community wanted. We work with the community, and, uh, and, we've gotten, uh, and we've gotten a lot of those. It's a very, very long list of every single little piece. Keep those things coming. Hopefully, we'll get that to Project F200 and so on. Um, and finally, we're about to launch our Xamarin Essentials. Xamarin Essentials is the companion to forms that allows you to abstract if you don't want to use the native APIs and you just want to have a, a, a nice uh, cross-platform abstractions. It is our cross-platform abstraction for the non-UI pieces. So um, you should give it a shot. And, uh, and that's it for the mobile segment. I would like to bring my, uh, my friends uh, Mads and Scott back to stage. Awesome. Thank you. <clears throat> So I think, uh, you know, kind of in closing, uh, we have, you know, this is just the start of .NET Conf 2018. There is a bunch of awesome sessions coming up over the next couple of days. Um, we were just looking at the schedule over there a second ago, and uh, James on your, your team has got mm -hmm. uh, a mobile session coming up. Uh, Dan Roth's got an ASP.NET Core update coming uh, as well. He's got a Blazor update coming. Uh, Diego on the team's got a uh, uh, EF update coming as well. So. Uh, and then we, t we already talked about tomorrow, we're going to kick off with some AI uh, with Ankit, and Caesar's got a section on that as well. So there's tons of awesome, and I'm, I'm skipping more, <laughs> plenty of people as well. Kendra's got an update on, uh, um, you know, what productivity features we have in Visual Studio. So there's tons of great content coming the next uh, day or two or three. Um, so please uh, watch that content and enjoy being a .NET developer. And I guess uh, Matt has a session. Uh, has a session just after uh, the break after, here. Yeah. yeah. And um, it, I don't know how bushed up my demos came out online, but uh, you know, fingers crossed. Uh, if anything didn't go out, you can see them there. And also on Friday, I have a session on Retro.net. So if you're a, you know, despite the fact that I work with UIs, I, I still love the command line. So if you're into that sort of thing, uh, I'll have something on Friday for you. Uh, but lots of awesome uh, .NET content coming. Uh, we have awesome .NET features coming out later this year. Uh, .NET Core 2.2, .NET Core 3.0 next year. Uh, lots of, there's just lots of good stuff. So anyways, if you're a .NET developer, please check it all out. Thank you for watching. Thank you. <laughs>